Hi, I'm Trevor Lund of RevTrev.com, and in this week's episode of RevTrev TV, I am uh, starting an interview with Mike Stickler of the Vision Group. And uh, Mike and I have connected on Twitter recently, and uh, we've checked out each other's sites and just really uh, feel God's, God's uh, doing some good things between us. And Mike is... Uh, uh, I'm just going to read from his bio here. He's uh, Mike Stickler's life experience serve as the foundation for his passion to help those who need the love and the relationship of Jesus Christ. Over the years, he's served as the executive director of Rescue Center for Homeless Men, Women, and Children, handled oversight of Men's Discipleship House, consulted with both prison fellowship ministries and family life marriage conferences, and contracted uh, as the festival director and director of church relations for the Louis Palau, uh, I'm saying his name wrong all the time, Palau Association. <laughs> Mike was the organizing catalyst of the Transform Transformation Dallas, a uh, partnership between Global Day of Prayer, KLTY's Celebration, Celebrate Freedom, and 90 Days of Blessing with the uh, Louis Palau Association. In addition to his professional experience, Mike also served as senior and associate pastor for nearly 13 years. Um, sorry for brutalizing that, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Actually, you did fine. It's Palau, Palau like the owl. Palau. Yeah, he, he's got a quote that I, I use all the time. He says, "You know, as Christians are are a lot like manure. You pile them up in a pile; they're going to burn a hole in the ground. But you spread them out over a large area, and they do a lot of good." And it's like, <laughs> I love that one. Anyway, um, uh, Mike is. Uh, the Vision Group. Did I already mention that? The Vision Group Ltd. Com. And um, what we wanted to talk today about uh, is basically, oh, one of these days. <laughs> I, I wanted to, I wanted to talk with Mike about why ministries should consider grants. And I've worked with a lot of ministries in a lot of different ways, and there's all kinds of different, um, you know, we, we a lot of different things come up when ministries start talking about grants. And maybe let's start with that first one, Mike. Um, the biggest question I, I get, like we've got a we've got a, a grant here in the province that I'm in that is called the Wild Rose Grant, and it's for nonprofits. It's any church can apply. But it comes from lottery winnings. It comes from sales of liquor. It comes from, and some some ministries just won't touch it, and others are like, "Hey, you know, <laughs> God takes from the wicked to give to the righteous." And what's what's that all about? So, I, let's let's talk about those questions. Should should ministries consider grants? What 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 do you? Is it a case by case scenario, or is it um, church culture, or what do you what do you say to that? It's a great question. You know, um, I'm actually sitting in my home just south of Reno, Nevada, and uh, Nevada is uh, got lots of money and access um, from what Christians would consider dubious sources. Um, most of our entire state's economy is run by gambling, um, and I get this question all the time: um, Should we? take money from a casino or should we take money from the lottery or should we take money um, from different sources whether it's alcohol we don't we don't really have a lot of that kind of approach and you know what this is what I've learned um, I think as long as you're not tying that brand as a partnership or a sponsorship mm -hmm. to um, your ministry I think it's an effective tool. Uh, I think you need to use discernment and prayer to determine if there are strings attached to that money that would compromise your, uh, your mission, your goals, and your values. But generally, uh, that money that's generated from whether it's real estate sales or gambling or anything that would not necessarily be considered um, you know, through the, a, a church activity or through generous um, giving um, could be a, a very good source for you. You just have to look at whether there's um, strings attached to it. And I got to tell you, my, my belief in this has evolved over the years. Um, I have a friend of mine who doesn't like me to use that term, evolved. <laughs> um, but working with the Palals a few years back, uh, they actually had a local community. And I, this is why it's important. 
we were doing a festival in a local community. One of the sponsors that stepped up was the local Budweiser distributor. Mm. And he wanted to sponsor a Luis Palau Proclamation Evangelism <laughs> Festival. <laughs> well, um, the Palau's weren't interested in tying the beer, if you can imagine, um, Budweiser to their name. Yeah. But they did sit down and talk with the family, and the family gave the sponsorship under their name. Mm. Now, what was great about that was that it opened a door for them to get in and actually meet this family, build a relationship, and the owner of that distributorship uh, came to know the Lord. Oh, wow. And so I challenge all of us bro brothers and sisters out there that we got to think about um, how the Lord would use um, approaches by the unrighteous towards um, you know, um, sanctified things. You, you talked about strings and like one of those strings could be, you know, like you want a sponsorship ad and have my logo all over the place. But what other strings should we be aware of that could come with a grant? Yeah, the biggest one is the um, right, especially here in the United States um, right now with the government grants. Government grants um, ebb and flow, if you will, um, depending on who's in office and the focus of the leadership of office at that time. I've been writing grants since the Clinton administration, and um, I've gone through some pretty big cycles, as you can imagine, and, and it depends on what they ask for. I literally, back when I was running the homeless mission, I had the police come to my, into my shelter and demand that they take all the cross, that we take the crosses off the walls um, and remove all the Bibles from the building because we had a federal grant. And some, some bureaucrat trying to do the right thing, they really were trying to do the right thing in San Francisco, um, initiated such an order. Wow. And the sad part was the, the lieutenant that was leading this, I call it a raid, it really wasn't a raid, but <laughs> leading this raid um, was, a, was a Christian. I, I personally knew him. And so you have to consider, now that was years ago, and, I, and quite frankly, things have changed a lot in that area, mm -hmm. but you have to really consider what kind of attachments, what kind of restrictions um, a government grant would, apply, uh, would put on it. And it's starting to be corporate, too. Um, as an example, a project I was working on, a benevolence project um, for Haiti last year, uh, Microsoft got a hold of us and they were very interested in sponsoring on this project and then they came to us and said you know what we're not going to sponsor you because in your website you say in your belief system that um, Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation and we have employees here that are Buddhists and Baha'is and, mm. and it's going to offend them so we're going to remove our support. Hmm. Uh, that, those kind of things happen Yeah, uh, and you just have to realize it's, it's getting more and more like that with um, corporations. Okay, what what um, what can grants? What what can you do with money from grants? Like, if I get a grant, uh, do I need to use it for a specific project that I, I kind of uh, got the money for, or you know what I'm saying? Like, is it is it? Yeah. Can I get a grant to run my ministry, or do I need it for this one project? Uh, grants are specific are typically project specific. So what you wrote in your grant proposal is how you have to spend the money. Okay. Um, you can't, and I've seen this happen. Um, we got some government grants under the Bush administration. They, the Bush administration was giving out these fifty thousand dollar capacity grants, and I had a couple of clients get the fifty grand and disappear. Okay. I had a couple of them get the fifty grand and spend it on things they didn't weren't supposed to. Right. Um, but morally, more importantly, morally, what you said you were going to do with it is how you have to spend it. But this is why it's a blessing to churches. Um, if you get a grant, and it, especially private foundation money, imagine you can use that money for your youth program, if that's what you wrote the grant for, or your food program, if that's what you wrote the grant for. And that frees up money on the other side of your budget to do other things, pay more salaries, get a bigger building. I, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. That's the blessing to it. It, it overall increases the health of your, your organization. What, uh, 
What's the biggest challenge that Christian ministries face today when it comes to fundraising and reaching their community? The biggest challenge that they have, and it's also the same reason why they don't get um, get funded, is a lack of vision. Mm. Most, uh, every pastor I talk to, every uh, parachurch ministry I talk to, they are busy doing great things, incredible things. That's their mission. It's what they're doing. But where they want to go and what they want to achieve and, and how to get there is lacking. And so when we communicate to funders, we have to, we have to share a vision that becomes so compelling that they're excited to get aboard. Mm. Uh, that that um, the, fa- the funders, you know, funders get tired of us asking over and over again based on need. You know, this family needs money. This, our church needs a new bathroom. Uh, we just continually ask over and over again based on need. What they're excited about doing is that you're doing something effective and you have a vision and how you're getting there. That, well, you said something there that just really, it, it, it tweaked something in me because um, the thought that I have going through my head often is, you know, you know, does God really respond to need? You know, like if he did, wouldn't the poorest nation this year be the richest next year or at least, you know, <laughs> right? you know, I see him moved by compassion. I see him moved by, by, by faith. You know, he moves, you know, and, and maybe that's what's faith with vision, right? Like it's, it's. I, I, they're two separate things, and I'm mixing it up here, and I'm doing this on the fly. But that's how how can people, how can organizations uh, focus their vision? You know, if they're so busy doing things, if they're so busy, you know, I I know pastor like a, a true pastor is more concerned about his his flock. You know, that's the way God's designed him to think. And uh, people can be pastors and have different, uh, you know have have an apostolic or have a have an evangelistic but a, a pastor's pastor will think about uh you know the, the people that he can reach and as far as i'm concerned that's why most churches are under 100 people because that's how many one person can can minister to because it's a pastor's pastor and that's great it's awesome but those type of people have a really you know i don't see a lot of them being visionaries either so how can someone who's not led by, how can an organization not led by a visionary get a clearer focus for vision? Yeah, <clears throat> I personally believe that if God's put somebody in leadership, he will give them a vision. Hmm. And I quite frankly think we don't go out and ask him um, hmm. for vision. When somebody asks me, how do I determine what my vision is? I tell them this, get your Bible, get a notepad and go get alone with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I mean alone, not in your office, but I mean go out by, to the lake, go to the beach, go to the mountains, go sit in your car. I don't care, but get alone and stay there days on end if that's what you need to do until the Lord shows you exactly where, you want, where he wants you to go. Mm-hmm. And if he wants you to go there, he'll, he'll clearly spell it out. Then the second step to that process is to get your, your elder board, your key staff, your the rest of your leaders together and do the same thing. Don't give them a tip on what God told you to do. Just go out and do the same thing and take them out for a day, separate them away from one another, a quarter of a mile or so at least, (laughs) and ask them to take their Bible and start asking God, where does this ministry, where do you want to take this ministry? When you bring them all back together, it will blow your mind how cohesive the direction is. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that tip. It's, it's uh, a great, great community building exercise too. And we all see God's uh, vision coming together. Well, uh, that's it for this week's episode of RevTrev TV and uh, be sure to check out Mike at uh, the vision group, ltd.com. And there'll be a link under this uh, uh, on RevTrev. Uh, and I might put a link under it right on the thing for YouTube and for iTunes as well. So you can see that. Uh, next time, we're going to continue our conversation with Mike, and we're, I'll talk about um, the fear factor in fundraising and all those good things. So thank you, Mike. Thanks for being with us. Let's catch you next time. This episode has been brought to you by Expectancy Press, resources that impart hope and empower destiny. When you choose to purchase products from expectancypress.com, you're supporting the work of Expectancy Ministries.
Are you a little afraid to do what God's told you to do? Get a copy of How Big Is Your Butt by Trevor Lund today.